Hi there. Um, we're going to carry on with Wind in the Willows, Chapter 1, Part 3. Uh, we met um, Otter and Badger. They both turned up. Uh, Rat and Mole were having a picnic. Uh, Badger just walked through. He'd humped a bit. He was feeling very sociable. But Otter was chatting away and he was telling them a little bit about Toad. Um, and uh, where we're going to pick it up, uh, Rat's just carrying the conversation about Toad. Once it was nothing but sailing, said Rat. Then he tired of that and took to punting. Nothing would please him but to punt all day and every day, and a nice mess he made of it. Last year it was houseboating, and we all had to go and stay with him on his houseboat and pretend we liked it. He was going to spend the rest of his life in a houseboat. It's all the same. Whatever he takes up, he gets tired of it and starts on something fresh. Such a good fellow too, remarked Otter reflectively, but no stability, especially in a boat. From where they sat, they could get a glimpse of the main stream across the island that separated them, and just then a wager boat flashed into view. The rower, a short, stout figure, splashing badly and rolling a good deal, but working his hardest. The rat stood up and held him, but Toad, for it was he, shook his head and settled sternly to his work. He'll be out of that boat in a minute if he rolls like that, said the rat, sitting down again. Of course he will, chuckled the otter. Did I ever tell you that the good story about the Toad and Lock Keeper? It happened this way. Toad. An errant mayfly swerved unsteadily athwart the current in an intoxicated fashion, affected by the young bloods of mayflies seeing life. A swirl of water and a cloop. The mayfly was visible no more. Neither was the otter. The mole looked down, the voice still in his ears, but the turf whereon he had sprawled was clearly vacant. Not an otter to be seen as far as the distant horizon, but again there was a streak of bubbles on the surface of the river. The rat hummed a tune and the mole recollected that animal et etiquette forbade any sort of comment on the sudden disappearance of one's friends at any moment, for any reason or no reason whatever. Well, well, said the rat, I suppose we ought to be moving. I wonder which of us had better pack the luncheon basket. He did not speak as if he was frightfully eager for the treat. Oh, please let me, said the mole. So, of course, the rat let him. Packing the basket was not quite such pleasant work as unpacking the basket. It never is. But the mole was bent on enjoying everything, and although just when he got the basket packed and strapped up tightly, he saw a plate staring up at him from the grass. When the job had been done again, the rat pointed out a fault which anybody ought to have seen. And last of all, behold, the mustard pot, which he'd been sitting on without knowing it. Still... Somehow, the thing got finished at last without much loss of temper. The afternoon sun was getting low as the rat schooled gently homewards in a dreamy mood, murmuring poetry things over to himself and not paying much attention to Mole. But the Mole was very full of lunch and self-satisfaction and pride, and already quite at home in a boat, or so he thought, and was getting a bit restless besides, and presently he said, Ratty, please, I want to row now. The rat shook his head with a smile. Not yet, my young friend, he said. Wait till you've had a few lessons. It's not so easy as it looks. The mole was quiet for a minute or two, but he began to feel more and more jealous of rats, sculling so strongly and so easily along, and his pride began to whisper that he could do it every bit as well. He jumped up and seized the school so suddenly that the rat, who was gazing out over the water and saying more poetry things to himself, was taken by surprise and fell backwards off his seat with his legs in the air for the second time, while the triumphant mole took his place and grabbed the skulls with entire confidence. "'Stop it, you silly ass!' cried the rat from the bottom of the boat. "'You can't do it. You'll have us over!' The mole flung his skulls back with a flourish and made a great dig in the water. He missed the surface altogether. His legs flew up above his head and he found himself lying at the top of the, on top of the prostate rat. Greatly alarmed, he made a grab at the side of the boat and the next moment, SPLOOSH! Over went the boat, and he found himself struggling in the river. Oh my, how cold the water was, and oh how very wet it felt. How it sang in his ears as he went down, down, down. How bright and welcoming the sun looked as he rose to the surface, coughing and spluttering. How black was his despair when he felt himself sinking again. Then a firm paw gripped him by the back of the neck. It was Rat, and he was evidently laughing. The mole could feel him laughing right down his arm and through his paw, and so into a, into the mole's neck. The rat got hold of a skull and shoved it under mole's arms. Then he did the same 
by the other side of him, and swimming behind him he propelled the helpless animal to shore, hauled him out, set him down on the bank, a squashy, pulpy lump of misery. When the rat had rubbed him down a bit, and wrung some of the wet out of him, he said, Now then, old fellow, trot up and down the towing path as hard as you can, till you're warm and dry again, while I dive for the luncheon basket. So, the dismal mole, wet and without, wet without and ashamed within, trotted about till he was fairly dry, while the rat plunged into the water again, recovered the boat, righted her, and made her fast, fetched his floating property to shore by degrees, and finally dived successfully for the luncheon basket and struggled to land with it. When all was ready for a start once more, the mole, limp and dejected, took his seat in the stern of the boat, and as he set off, he said in a low voice broken with emotion, Ratty, my generous friend, I'm very sorry indeed for my foolish and ungrateful conduct. My heart quite fails me when I think how I might have lost the beautiful luncheon basket. Indeed, I've been a complete ass, and I know it. Will you overlook it this once and forgive me, and let things go on as before? That's all right, bless you, responded the rat cheerily. What's a little wet to water at? I'm more in the water than out of it most days. Don't think any more about it, and look here. I really think you'd better come and stop with me for a while. It's a plain and rough, you know. Not like Toad House at all. But you haven't seen that yet. Still, I can make you comfortable. And I'll teach you to row and to swim, and you'll soon be as handy on the water as any of us. The mole was so touched by his kind manner of speaking that he could find no voice to answer him, and he had to brush away a tear or two with the back of his paw. But the rat kindly looked in another direction, and presently the mole's spirits revived again, and he was even able to give some straight-back talk to a couple of more hens who were sniggering at each other about his bedraggled appearance. When they got home, the rat made a bright fire in the parlour, and planted the mole in the armchair in front of it, having fetched down a dressing gown and slippers for him, and told him the river boats, told him the river stories till supper time. Very thrilling stories they were too, to an earth-dwelling animal like Mole, stories about weirs and sudden floods and leaping pike and steamers that flung hard bottles, at least bottles were certainly flung, and from steamers, so presumably by them, and about herons and how particular they were about whom they spoke to, and about adventures down drains and night fishing with otter, or excursions far afield with badger. Supper was a most cheerful meal, but very shortly afterwards a terribly sleepy Mole had to be escorted upstairs by his considerate host, to the best bedroom, where he soon laid his head on the pillow in great peace and contentment, knowing that his new friend the river was lapping the sill of his window. This day was only the first of many similar ones for the emancipated mole, each one of them longer and full of interest as the ripening summer moved onward. He learned to swim and to row, and entered into the joy of running water. With his ear to the reed stems he caught at intervals something of what the wind went whispering so constantly among them. So that's the end of chapter one, and um, we've learnt a little bit about the characters, and uh, as the book progresses we'll learn about their adventures. Um, obviously a lot of strange words, um, we've got uh, some nauti nautical terms, terms about boats, about uh, sea going and river going boats, and um, uh, I think we had skulls, we've heard about a wager boat, I had to look one, what a wager boat what was, was. Uh, I didn't know that. Um, we've um, we've got stern. We've had a few nautical terms, so uh, look them up, and when we come back together again, keep a note of them and tell me what you've learned. Uh, we'll have uh, chapter two uh, soon, so I look forward to reading that with you. Keep safe and keep reading. Bye.